1 Timothy 6, beginning at verse 13. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So Paul is concluding his letter to his young protege, a young man by the name of Timothy. Timothy is a pastor of a church there in the mighty and powerful city of Ephesus. And he's been giving final orders to him, urging him to flee from a variety of things. And as we've been going through this chapter, we've seen the things that he, that he told Timothy to flee from. He's to flee from pride, from disputations, from arguments over words. He's to flee from envy and strife and reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings. He's to flee the greedy manipulation of people's faith in order to make personal financial gain. And the reason he tells them to flee these things is because ultimately, in ministry especially, but in life in general, character matters. God is busy transforming man into his image. God intends us to be transformed and conformed into the image of Christ. And so character matters if you're going to have ministry. In Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so God is in the business, if you will, of transforming man's character. So you're to flee certain things and pursue others. Now, that is something we need to understand because our way of life represents the kind of God that we serve. So a minister is to have a good character because the minister represents the kingdom of God. The minister ultimately actually represents God himself. And he's righteous. And because God is righteous, his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness. That would mean those who represent the Lord and his kingdom must pursue righteousness themselves. And that's why Paul urged Timothy to flee certain things and to pursue others. The things that he's to pursue are virtues. They're not what false teachers pursue. So he tells them, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, faith, love, patience, pursue gentleness. You see, in contrast to the greedy, manipulative, self-centered teachers, Timothy, you're to be godly. As we looked at the pursuit of righteousness, that simply speaks of being in harmony with the law of God. And being in harmony with the things of the Lord results in godliness or a holy life, and it will produce love and patience and gentleness. And those virtues reveal a relationship that we have with God, and it contrasts with the character of a false teacher. So with that as foundation, Timothy will be able to fight what is called a noble fight for men's souls. That's what he said in verse 12 when he said, fight the good fight of faith. He is fighting what is called the virtuous or the noble fight. You see, character gives him the platform that enables him to be effective. It creates the platform that credibility is built on. It earns the respect of those who are listening to him. So if you want to be used by the Lord, Timothy, and by application, if I want to be used by the Lord, my character counts. Character does matter. Now, Paul included his list of Christian virtues with patience. We're to have patience and gentleness. And he included in his list patience, because the sense is that the fight is not over immediately, so Timothy, you need to continue to fight. You're to continue to flee the vices of your opponents, and you're to continue pursuing virtue. And as you continue this warfare, remain aware that it's a fight. It's a fight of faith. You see, as a minister, you must be aware that, that there is a cosmic war that is being fought. You're combating the spirit of the age, a spirit of the age that denies and rejects the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Jude 3 tells us to contend earnestly for the faith 
which was once for all delivered to the saints. In his day, as is true in our own, the overwhelming majority rejected Jesus Christ. And, and what would happen is false teachers would take elements of the gospel message, but they would add to it or subtract from it. Though the messages may be different, they all had one thing in common. They rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. We saw in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that Paul referred to their teachings as doctrines of demons. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. So by gutting the gospel, they're eliminating its saving power. Romans 1.16 says to us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Colossians 2.8-10 through 10 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not intellectual alone. It contains elements of, that are intellectual, and the most brilliant mind, you could, you could have the most brilliant mind and still miss the point of the gospel because it's not simply intellectual. It isn't just a philosophic message. It is, it is not a message that if you try hard, you're going to make it. It has intellectual elements, and it's very deep, but it's also a moral message. You need to understand, we need to remember as Christians that the gospel is a moral message. It appeals to the conscience of man. Every one of us has a God-shaped hole in our heart that only God himself can fill. We have questions, and we wonder, and we go through life, and we have trials, and we can have no hope, and we can have no faith, and we can have no joy, we can have no peace, and we wonder why, and the gospel supplies the answer. The gospel says, well, it's because you are hostily opposed to God. It's because you're at war with God. There's a cosmic conflict that has taken place. God says something is black, you say it's white. God says something is sweet, you say it's sour. God says something is forbidden, you say that's what I want to do. There's a war that's going on. And until you surrender through the gospel, until you surrender, you're going to remain at war with God and have no peace. So the gospel is more than philosophy. The gospel is a moral message intended to speak to the heart of man, to awaken within that man or that woman the reality of a lost condition and an emptiness of soul. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes. And therefore, I'm going to go out and preach that same message. I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to detract from it. I'm going to just give it. And Timothy, as a pastor in a very powerful city that is filled with immorality, was filled with so many things that God is opposed to, but God wants to heal, make sure that you don't compromise the faith. Contend earnestly for it. You see, in fighting this good fight, you're getting a firm grip on everlasting life. He had said that in verse 12 when he said, lay hold on eternal life. You're getting a firm grip on everlasting life. And everlasting life is more than length of days. Everlasting life speaks of equality. Everlasting life can manifest itself now. It does so in holiness and love and peace and joy. It's really the fruit of a fellowship with God. It is being filled with God's presence, with his spirit. And so lay hold of that and live in that way, Timothy, because that develops a credibility for you to be able to continue to minister and reach these people who are lost. And so as he's been sharing with him, he moves into verse 13, and he says, I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. So Paul urges Timothy to remain faithful to the master and to remain faithful to his message. You see, Timothy, you confess Jesus before many witnesses, so you must be faithful to him. He had said it in verse 12 when he had said, you have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Remain faithful 
In Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul said it like this. He said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what is going to encourage Timothy to hold fast to God, to be faithful to his word? Well, notice what he says again in verse 13, when he says, I urge you in the sight of God, one who gives life to all things. In the midst of your ministry, remember, God is with you. He doesn't leave you, nor does he forsake you. Jesus on one occasion prayed and said, now I'm alone and yet I'm not alone, for you are with me. My God does not leave me, nor does he forsake me. So in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the affliction, in the midst of the rejection and sometimes the persecution, remember something, remain firm and steadfast because God is with you. You need to remember that even in suffering and unto death, God is your help. In Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So you preach a message of hope for eternity and embrace this message yourself because it's in this hope that will keep you strong in your times of adversity. And we go through adversity. We, we sometimes, when we get saved, we think, well, now it's all, it's all done, no more problems. Is that true? No. I wish I could stand up there and say, listen, man, all you need to do is get right with God and you will giggle yourself to sleep every night and you'll wake up with a, it's not that way, is it? It, it, it seems more difficult day by day because the climate is much more oppressive in rejection of Christ day by day. So he's saying, hold fast to your confession. In the midst of the affliction, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the rejection, in the midst of the oppression, in the midst of all that you go through, hold fast to the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let go. Make sure you remain tightly with him. Somebody said, Timothy is exhorted to fight his good fight, ever mindful that he is in the presence of that great being who could and would, even if Timothy's faithfulness should lead him to danger and to death, still preserve him on earth or in paradise. Hold tightly and don't let go. It is God who gives life to all things. Hold fast to him. And he says, before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. So remember that Jesus witnessed the good confession. Now remember Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a Roman governor who Jesus, whom Jesus stood before on the night that he was sentenced to the cross. And remember that as Jesus was there before this Roman governor and he was conversing with him, that the conversation, part, a part of that conversation is recorded by John. And Jesus was there and remained steadfast even before this man. John, in chapter 18 of his gospel, verses 36 through 38, records how that Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I've come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? And so Jesus there, even in the face of a man who didn't even know what truth was, a hardened man who'd been in various places, undoubtedly had heard a lot of philosophies spouted, standing before truth himself, Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. As Jesus is standing before him and says, the ones who hear the truth are mine, he said, what is truth? And a lot of people to this day say the same kind of thing. So Paul is saying to Timothy, remain steadfast, remain faithful, Timothy, to the end, even to the point of death, 
Jesus was faithful to the end, so don't grow afraid. He didn't, neither should you. Now that was the ministry of Paul. That was his mentality. Remember in Acts 21, verses 10 through 14, how Luke recorded this? Luke said, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Why are you breaking my heart with your tears? Don't you understand that for this cause I was sent into the world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus? Don't you understand that's my calling? And if I go to Jerusalem and they bind me and they put me in jail and ultimately I die, I'm willing to do that. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, you need to use the example of your Savior, Jesus Christ, who witnessed that good confession. Notice verse 14, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. So this encourages him to hold fast to the very end as he looks unto Jesus. So Paul tells him, keep this commandment without spot, blameless. The words without spot speak of it being untainted, blameless, speaks of being without reproach. So the command is for him to teach the message of the gospel properly. It is not to be given in any form with compromise. It is to be given in its fullness. It is to be spoken with faith and exampled with a life. And that allows the gospel to have its proper work. There are, sadly, there are, there are many who don't understand this at this time, and I pray that they, that they over time will. Of course, when you first get saved, you're not fully mature yet. Yes, it takes time, it takes days, weeks, months, and years to begin to mature and to get to the point where you begin to understand some of the things that the Lord that are really transforming truths and all. You get saved and you have some basic elements of the gospel and certain things seem to happen more rapidly. Certain sins seem to fall away and then others are besetting. They seem to remain. They become the things that you wrestle with more regularly. And so what you're to do is you're to hold fast to these things and, and to walk in this truth and, and to grow and, and God's word begins to work within you. And God's word begins to confront certain things that you at one time thought were okay, and then you ultimately begin to realize that they're not. The, the gospel's work is to confront and to cure moral ills. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, it says, The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There are things that you think are okay, then you read the word of God and God says they're not. And you say, oh, you know, I must be misinterpreting scripture because they're pet sins, you like those sins. But you know what happens, man, after a while, the Lord begins to work in your life. Your delight begins to be in his law. And it's what you meditate day and night on. It changes you from the inside, and your life begins to radically be transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus. And your friends who know you the best will look at you, and they'll begin to say, something happened to you. Something occurred in you, and I've been watching you, and I've seen this, and, and I respect you for it, because God is real. And that's what happens. So Timothy... If you're going to be used by the Lord, let God conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. And by the way, serve the Lord with anticipation of being with him because Jesus Christ promised to return. 
Notice again in verse 14, keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again unto you and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus promised to come and take us to be with him. One day, and it's coming soon, somebody has asked, what is the next prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before the return of the Lord for the church? And the answer biblically is there is no other prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. So it can happen at any moment in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be gone and be with him. And therefore we ought to be living as if we anticipate that. And that's what Paul is saying. Live in anticipation to be with Jesus Christ. He promised and he will return because the return of the Lord is to spur us to a godly life. We're not supposed to say, oh, our Lord delays his coming and then begin to drink and beat the other servants. That's the evil one. That's the evil worker. The one in anticipation is the one who's awaiting because he can come at any moment and we want to be prepared for him as he does. In Titus 2, 11 through 14, it says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. In the King James, it's his own peculiar people, so I prefer special. I've already been peculiar. I'd rather be special. So he says, Christ is returned. Verse 15 is returning. Verse 15, which will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So he says, he will manifest this in his own time. God is going to provide an incredible future for believers in heaven, so hold on. Prepare yourself. Faithfully await the return of the Lord Jesus. He's returning at the time appointed by the Father. So he's saying, wait for him. You see, the key is living as if he can return today. My own pastor, Chuck Smith, once said, if you knew that Jesus was coming this evening, what would you do differently today? If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he'll be home, he'll be coming to take us home at 8 o'clock, what would you do differently today? If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he'd be there at that time, and then he lets us think for a moment, then he says, then why don't you do that? Live as if you expect him to come at any moment. And that's what the Bible teaches us to do, to hold on and to wait. In 1 John 3, 2 and 3, it says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Revelation 22, 20 says, He who testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And then John has to add, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. He is so blessed that he actually is closing with what is called a doxology. A doxology is a hymn of praise, the song of praise. So he speaks of the Lord in this way. He says he is the blessed and only potentate. When's the last time you used the word potentate? We don't use it very often unless it's a wife speaking to the husband. But normally, <laughs> the word potentate speaks of a possessor of power, a ruler. He's saying God is the ruler. In Daniel 4.35, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? He is the potentate. Secondly, he is king of kings, lord of lords. He is the sovereign ruler over heaven and earth. 
He's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He is the ruler. In Deuteronomy 10, 17, the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Third, he has, he alone has immortality. He is not subject to death. God has what is referred to as inherent immortality. He is, by essence of him being God, he is life itself. He has immortality within himself. We receive from him eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. We receive that, but he has that inherently. Fourth, dwelling in unapproachable light. That speaks of his Shekinah glory. I used to think it was his Chicano glory, but it's not. It's his Shekinah glory. Just kidding. He is pure. He is holy. In 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Psalm 104, verse 2, he wraps himself in light as with a garment. He says, fifthly, whom no man has seen or can see. No man can see God in all his fullness and glory as a human being here on the face of the earth. Sometimes we have said to the Lord, I'd like to see you. Show yourself to me. <laughs> no, you, you don't want that. There's a man in the Bible by the name of Moses who said exactly that. Lord, show me your glory. And God said, no man can see my glory and live. No, he dwells in a light that is unapproachable. There is no way a human being could look at God in his glory any more than a human being could stare at the sun from 10 feet away and survive. He is unapproachable. So what did he do? He took upon himself human flesh and manifested himself to us as Jesus walking on the face of the earth so that we could see God incarnate. That's how it worked. Moses says, show me your glory. God says, no man can see me and live. And so God hides him in a cleft of a rock and passes by. Exodus 33 and 34, he passes by and he gives his name, the Lord, the Lord God. And he begins to speak his name because it's within his name that you have a revelation of his glory. And he begins to speak concerning who he is so that Moses can understand why it's not possible for him to have a full on eye to eye relationship with God, there has to be something between us that causes you to survive. No human eye can see God in his full glory, but we will see him when we receive our glorified bodies. And when we see him, you know, there are people who say, oh, when I see God, I'm going to ask him questions. What an arrogant thing to say. Really? <laughs> Yeah, you're going to put God on the witness stand, right? You say, I just want to know why my dog died when I was eight. Do you honestly think that? Do you really think that? That you're going to have questions in heaven? Do you really think that? You know, the only question you're going to have is, how did I get here? Oh, it was through Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me laugh because people every once in a while, well, I'm going to ask God, oh, really? Really, you're going to ask God. You wouldn't even speak to your principal when you're in elementary school, but you're going to talk to God. No, it's not going to be that way at all. No, it's not. What we're going to do is we're going to fall before him and we're going to praise him and worship him forever, forever. If you don't want to worship God forever, you're not saved. Because that's why we were created to have relationship with God. The Bible makes it very clear in Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne 
And to the Lamb, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's what we'll be doing. I look forward to that so much, to worship the Lord and praise him for all that he has done. We will see him one day. And he says, to whom be honor and everlasting power, because he is worthy of all of our praise. Psalm 41, 13, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Romans eleven thirty six, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. With that, as what he's revealing and reminding Timothy about, with that said, in light of it, here's a practical portion that he begins to close with in verses 17 through 19. What are our priorities to be as we await his return? You see, in verse 17, notice what he says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. In light of this, what are my priorities to be as I await the return of Christ? It's interesting how Paul begins to close by speaking of those who are financially prosperous, and he's speaking of believers here. He had already spoken about riches and the desire to become rich in verses 9 and 10. Remember what he had said in verses 9 and 10? Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And he went on in verse 10 to say, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So he's already addressed that. He had spoken about those with a desire. That word desire is what is called a settled desire. It is something you have thought about. It's, it's, it's the result of reasoning something through. It's not simply an emotional desire, I wish. No, it's a, it's a reasoned desire. It's something you're thinking through. There are steps that I'm going to take to get these riches, is what he's speaking about. But he says the person who has those particular desires, he says they, in verse 9, fall into temptation. The word fall is, a, is actually in the Greek tense that speaks of a continual falling. They are continually trapped by their desire for more. So what he had said already is, loving money leads to bondage. Greedy people are trapped by irrational and harmful lusts. When you are greedy for money, you'll do almost anything for it. You can resort to violence, and you can resort to stealing, killing, ripping people off to get a little bit more for yourself. So here he's speaking concerning the same topic from a different perspective. He's not speaking of those who want to be rich. Notice with me, he's speaking of those who already are. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches. So he's speaking concerning those who already are rich. Again, Ephesus was a large and prosperous city. Some in the church were financially well off. He doesn't want those who are well off to be treated by the members of the church as if they're evil sinners. I want to talk to you about this for just a moment. I think it's practical in this moment in the life that we're living in this age, in this year, moving into the next year, to be honest with you. I want to speak to you a little bit about this here, as it says again, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, 
storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Let me talk to you about some things that I think are relevant as it relates to this. I believe that America has what is called a selective conscience. America seems to, as a nation, and I think we get a lot of this selective conscience from the press, to be honest with you, from the newspapers, we have a selective conscience. There are certain things that we think are right and certain things that we think are wrong, and we popularize those things through, through various means. And so it wasn't that long ago when anybody who had finances of any sort became the villain. And they still are to this day, the evil one percenters and all. And you hear that quite often. You hear, oh, these people are rich and they're bad. And all rich people are bad. And there are some people who honestly believe that. And that's unfortunate because that's not true. But there are quite a number of people who do. They have a selective conscience concerning the rich. And the people who work to advance and become wealthy are often targeted. The liberal press seems to actually hate them because they became successful. They actually worked. They invented something. People are using it. They became financial wealthy. They employ a lot of people. And then the press seems to hate them and vilify them constantly. They're the evil one percenters. A few years ago, an economist by the name of, of Thomas Sowell made an interesting observation. He wrote in an article that I read, a recent study showed the median income of major corporate CEOs to be about $8 million a year. I'll let that settle because that number million doesn't mean very much to people today. Million? Are you kidding me? They ain't nothing, really. Eight million dollars a year. It's a lot of money. You can eat a lot of McDonald's with eight million. Eight million a year is a lot of money. And when you hear that number, you go, wow, for just being a CEO, the average? What right does this person have? to have that much money, they must be greedy. They must be evil. I'm telling you, you know this, I know this. I'm just addressing what we all know. There are a lot of people. It's wrong, it's unfair. You should work, you should invent, you should create, you should employ, and then you should give to me, or you're greedy. So we think that way about CEOs. But Thomas Sowell went on to say this, that's less than a third of what Alex Rodriguez earned, baseball player, and less than one thirtieth of what Oprah Winfrey made. Oprah? The Oprah? That one. But no one is denouncing them for greed. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen people carrying signs saying, you know, Kershaw's making too much? I haven't, maybe you have, I haven't. And I began to, I always get curious about these things. I began to think, hmm, LeBron James, amazing, amazing basketball player on the wrong team, but an amazing <laughs> basketball player. You know what he made last year, this year? $86.2 million. Anybody marching against LeBron? Anybody? No, why not? Why not? Mark Wahlberg, you know how much he made? $68 million. Anybody in front of his mansion or one of his mansions saying, unfair, unfair, you should let me go see your movies or whatever you do for free? Unfair, greedy, greedy. No, of course you don't see the Bill Gates. Who wants to talk about Bill? He doesn't tithe to my church. <laughs> he should, Bill, could you? <laughs> no, $90 billion net worth. That's a number none of us understand. I don't, I don't, I, I can't, that's that a number I can't understand. But I don't see anybody marching against Bill Gates. Uh, a movie came out, what is it, The Last Jedi, right? 
the first, their opening weekend, $220 million. Did somebody march against that? Did somebody go out with a lightsaber and... <laughs> Yoda didn't say a thing. <laughs> How come? You ever think about that? How come? How come people don't say anything about Oprah? How come people don't say anything about Wahlberg or LeBron or you name it? Why don't they? They're making an awful lot more than any CEOs. CEO averages 8 million, LeBron over 80 million. It's because we like basketball. It's because we like to be entertained by these people who are actors, or we use products that are made by these inventors. So that's okay if they're rich, because their politics and the morals are like mine. And that's where we have a problem here in the United States, is we take money and we say money is the root of all evil, but I'm selective in when it comes to, and yet Paul said, no, it's the love of money so you have to teach people who are rich because they can become arrogant because they use it for themselves because that's what can happen when you're rich. So riches in and of themselves are not the question. What you do with them is what he's addressing. So Paul isn't writing condemnation of those who are rich. What he's calling for is stewardship of their God-given resources when you read your Bible, you'll see this. There are various people in Scripture who are wealthy. Look in the Old Testament, and you see men like Abraham. You see men like, like King David and, and King Solomon. These are very, very wealthy men. They were God-fearers and blessed by God. In the New Testament, you see Zacchaeus and Nicodemus. You see Joseph of Arimathea. You see Tabitha and others that are wealthy. And God blessed them. There's nothing wrong with wealth in and of itself. It's not a sin to be wealthy. And sometimes wealth is simply God blessing a life. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So what do you do? If somebody has wealth, well, you command them. Command those who are rich, he said, instruct them in this present age not to be haughty, and not to trust in uncertain riches. So Paul tells Timothy that he needs to teach the rich concerning money, because there are certain sins that accompany material wealth that should be avoided. One, he says they can become haughty. Teach them not to. The word haughty isn't a word that we use very often. It means conceited, having an exalted opinion of themselves. It's the idea of looking down on other people with an air of superiority. It's the real wealthy person going into a restaurant, cutting in front of other people who already have the reservations, and they say, hey, it's me, give me my table. It's that attitude. He said they can be arrogant. They can be haughty. They can push themselves in front of other people because, after all, you're nothing. You don't make anything. I'm very important, and thus I ought to be given better, better care. He said they can be haughty. A rich person can be, so teach them not to. They can fall into the temptation of expecting special treatment. They can be rude and demanding. Proverbs 18, 23 says, the poor man utters supplications, the rich man answers roughly. And that's true. He says, teach him not to trust in uncertain riches. You see, you cannot trust wealth because it's uncertain, but you can trust in the living God. Wealth can be gained and lost suddenly. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5, do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. Proverbs eleven twenty eight: 28, he who trusts in his riches will fall. Rather than trusting money, fix your hope on God because he gives us richly all things to enjoy. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. Now all of this, and I'm going to develop this with you, now we get to a practical place in this. All of this rests on one simple thing, what you set 
your heart on. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth will rust, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's get practical. He says, let them do good and rich in good works, willing to share. Many at this point, even in this church right now, are saying, well, this really doesn't apply to me anyway. I'm not rich. But is that true? Is that true? I once read 25% of those living in India make less than 40 cents a day. Some of you may or may not know, I, I spent a month in, in India. Uh, I went on trips to India to minister twice, once for 16 days and the other for 13 or 14, somewhere in that area. It's been a month. I've been in New Delhi. I've been in Bombay, New Delhi, Madras, Trivandrum. I've walked the streets. I've seen things I've never seen before. I've seen poverty in India unlike anything I'd seen in the world up to that point. We were driving, for example, on a bus, and I was in the front and speaking to our guide, and we pulled up in a certain area, and there was a woman who was seated under an awning. There were large rocks on one side of her and gravel on the other, and I saw her with a hammer as she was hitting the rocks. And I said, what is she, she doing? He said, that's her job. She works under that awning. And you need to understand, it's between 90 to 100 degrees. And she's under this awning with little shade, with a small ball-peen hammer. And he says, she's under that awning 10 hours a day. And she makes 50 cents. And she takes the 50 cents that she made and she feeds her children with it. And she does that every day. I saw things that I've never seen before. I saw traffic islands in major cities with tents, cardboard shacks, where the people actually live on traffic islands. I saw things from the north to the south. Poverty, poverty that I've never seen before. I've seen it in, in Manila, Philippines. I've seen sidewalks in residential areas where the people have built shacks out of anything they could find, including cardboard, and were living on the sidewalk in front of houses. Picture yourself driving to your home and having the whole area, your whole area, with a shanty town there in front. That's how they live. I've seen that. I've seen it in Mexico. I've seen it in South America. I've seen it around the world. Are you rich? If you have more than one pair of shoes, you are. If you have more than one pair of socks, you are. If you have more than one pair of pants, or even a pair of pants, you are. We just don't see it that way. You know why we don't see it that way? Because Americans are very, very rich. We don't see it. I had just seen a girl. She couldn't have been eight or nine years old. I was in Manila. I saw a little girl, eight or nine years old, in front of a McDonald's. In the McDonald's, they had armed guards with M16s in front of the McDonald's. And she was standing in front asking for change so she could eat. And that was everywhere that we were as we were ministering, everywhere. Then I went to my room, I sat down, I turned the TV, an American commercial was on where they had a cat eating cat food out of crystal. Cat food out of crystal, pampering our pets. 
while I'm watching a baby who can't even afford a 75 cent hamburger. Do you wonder why Americans are hated throughout the world? The things that we have and take for granted. Are you rich? Yes, we are. Is it a sin to have finances? No. Am I saying that? No. Don't misunderstand me. But we can be in a church service just like this saying, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not rich. Bill Gates is rich. No, by proportion, we are very rich. Do you know in Zambia, 94% live on under $2 a day? In Nigeria, 92%. Mali, 90%. Tanzania, 89%. Burundi, 87%. Niger, 85%. Madagascar, 85%. Central African Republic, 84%. Zimbabwe, 83%. They all live under $2 a day. Compared to the majority of the world, the average American is wealthy. We are. We are. But there's something in us, the eyes of men are never satisfied. How much is enough? A little bit more. It's in our nature. It's something we're aware of. We just had Christmas. My baby girl gets Christmas presents. One of them, I'll leave her unnamed, gets Christmas presents. Before you know it, she's wanting to open the other ones. So what do they get? Because that's in us, it's bound up within us. We have to learn to be generous. If you think that we are naturally generous, you don't have kids. Because <laughs> we're not. Now some kids are amazing in their generosity, that's a fact, we know that. Some are, not all. Because within us is a desire for more, it's just part of what we are by nature. So that's why he says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. We have to be trained. We have to be taught. We have to learn to do good and to be rich in good works. Our finances are to be used for the benefit of others. That's what he means by being rich in good works. In Titus 3.14, let our people learn to maintain good works, meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. He says, be ready to give and willing to share. Ready to give means we are to have generosity that rises from real concern. I have friends of mine, minister friends of mine, that, that the Lord has used wealthy people in their churches or in the Christian world to do much good through their generous giving. That's what he's teaching. Raul has told me, my friend Raul Reese from Golden Springs has said, you know, somebody donated a million dollars so we could make a movie. Greg Glory has many people who don are donors because he does great work in evangelism. And that's a great thing when you have the church aware of eternity and the generous members who support it. And that's what Paul's talking about. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Why do you do that? Verse 19, finally, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This is a faith that anticipates being in heaven. The rich are not to be concerned about getting a return on their investment in this life. Being generous is not a financial strategy that pays off instantly. Instead, look ahead to heaven. That's where you receive your ultimate reward. And because a believer has an eternal perspective, we of all people are to be the most generous. We are the ones who say this person has a need and I will meet that need the way the early church was in Acts 4, 34 and 35. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. The church cared for believers because the spirit of generosity is in the church. But you have to be taught to give. You know, I can speak on a variety of things very easily. But every time I speak on giving, even if it's the only time I have to, somebody in the congregation or listening online saying, that's why I hate churches. They're always asking for money. I never speak about it unless it's in the passage. But I believe what God is saying, don't you? 
I believe in what God is saying. I believe that God will bless a cheerful giver. I believe that. I believe that the church is supposed to support one another. And I believe that we're laying up treasures in heaven. And that one day, as we enter in, we receive our reward. And it's not that long from now that some of us will enter in. And I do pray that there is something waiting for us that we laid in advance.